Welcome, everyone, to our AdDot podcast. I have with me today two engineers and architects, Stefan Hofer and Henning Schwentner. And they are the co-authors of a book in my series, Domain Storytelling. And I look forward to talking with them today and familiarizing folks with the ideas behind domain storytelling, how it can help you, along with other tools that you may be using in your software development efforts, whether or not you are using domain-driven design. Welcome, both of you. And uh, Stefan, maybe you could just tell a little bit about the work first. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Vaughn. Thanks for having us. So I'm a software engineer. I started software engineering in Austria, and then I came to, to Hamburg, Germany, 15, 16 years ago. That's where I met Henning. And I uh, uh, worked as a software engineer for, for many years, but um, today my focus is more on training, coaching, doing requirements, engineering, helping teams uh, to build better business software. That's what I do these days. Yes, and um, I'm Henning, and I'm a coder, coach, and consultant. That's what I put on my business card. So it's CCC for DDD. So when I'm lucky, I um, get my hands on the keyboard and... I work with teams on the code, but I also work with people who work with teams um, as a coach, uh, that is, give trainings in, for example, domain storytelling and other topics in software architecture, software development, and domain-driven design. And consultant, um, that's, of course, I um, work with teams, usually splitting up their monoliths. That's um, one of the big topics now, um, cutting and slicing. Um, bringing structure back into old software, into legacy software, modularizing it, and maybe turn it into a modular monolith or uh, into microservices. So tell us, kind of, uh, okay, these are not nutshell books, but in a nutshell, (laughs) um, what is domain storytelling? So storytelling is at the heart of human communication. So we thought, why not use it to overcome misunderstandings when talking about business processes and designing software. So the idea is that by telling and visualizing stories, domain experts and teams, they come together, they can um, discuss the domain, discuss the processes, discuss the needs that they have, uh, make this knowledge visible and tangible by um, drawing domain stories. So these are business processes visualized with a couple of icons, arrows, and a lot of words from the domain. Yeah, so if you um, want to build software, you have to talk to people, to people from the domain. And domain storytelling provides a very simple way to communicate with um, domain experts. So we bring together two kinds of people, domain experts on the one hand, developers on the other hand, and they should talk to each other and they should not have misunderstandings. And because it's so easy to misunderstand each other, especially if you're a developer and you're talking to a user and talking to a real person, um, then it's um, that's why it's especially important um, to get rid of these misunderstandings. So the um, in a nutshell, the easy thing is um, we let uh, the people tell us their story and why they tell their story. We paint a picture of that or we draw a diagram of that story to show the people, this is what I have understood, what you have un- uh, told me. Is this right? Did I understand you right? And we're using a very simplistic so-called pictographic language for that. So, for example, um, if you are building software for a cinema and then um, uh, a domain expert from the cinema tells you, a uh, movie gore, who's kind of an expert in this um, uh, in, in this domain, tells you um, the movie gore watches a film. Then we draw that sentence um, with uh, simple icons. So we draw a stick figure, draw a movie gore, write movie gore below it, and then we draw an arrow. Um, that's the activity where we draw watches, and then we draw a film icon and draw and write film below that. And that's the first sentence. And then, of course, the story isn't made of just one sentence, but of several sentences. So we let them tell the whole story and we paint the whole story and we show them, is this what we we understand? Is that right? Or do we have to change? anything? I'll use an analogy here. I hope 
you as authors are, and actually kind of creators of this idea aren't offended, but you're not writing a novel. When you say storytelling, it's not like filling a Microsoft Word document full of uh, sentences and so forth. You're, you're, you're drawing pictures with some supporting text. And therefore, if a child can understand a book, right, very pictographic book, then certainly uh, business people and software developers can agree on the, the pictographic sort of flow of this use case or scenario. Yeah, I think so. So the, the important thing is that everyone is in the same room and that the people see the picture as it evolves, as the story unfolds. We simultaneously draw the picture. And once uh, it is visual, people really, they, they do that in the workshops. They point at an arrow and say, no, this should go in the other direction. Or no, this is not the word that I use. Or the, um, before we use a different icon, um, can, you, can you use that again? So once it's it's there on a on a screen or on a whiteboard or on a flip chart, um, people can criticize it and give give feedback immediately. And this is immensely valuable, for example, to overcome misunderstandings. Yeah. So it, it is not just a way to draw a scenario, but a way to get conversation going and make sure that everybody has this sort of uh, shared mental model or a shared understanding of what's happening. It's very powerful. And as you said, it's not just boxes and lines like maybe UML. Maybe it has a little bit of um, throwback, perhaps, to, to UML, maybe collaboration diagrams or something like that, but much more expressive. Is that what you would describe? Yeah, I, I would agree. And I would say um, it, it uh, serves a, a kind of a different need than UML. Um, for me, UML is typically a communication a means for communication between developer and developer and domain storytelling and all the other collaborative modeling methods are means to communicate between developer and domain expert. So I think UML is okay for developers, but of course you have to learn a lot and it's hard to teach um, a, a non-technical person what all these different symbols mean. And that's what we want to have in, in domain stories, very simple icons, as you said, even my little daughter should be able to understand what these icons mean. And it's also important to have not only the icons, of course, but also to have the words written down because we want to learn the domain language. Of course, we want to be able to understand what's really happening. And we want to use this to build a ubiquitous language um, in, in the sense of BDD in the end, of course. So I, I think that the important is this co combination of uh, of having both, having pictures and having words um, uh, written down together. Yeah, it's a fine example of power in simplicity. So you just mentioned domain-driven design and um, the, the book, you know, Domain Storytelling talks about uh, a way to build domain-driven software. Can you explain how uh, domain-driven design and domain storytelling match up together? Yeah, so we, we think that domain storytelling fits very well uh, into the DDD philosophy because we use it to understand a domain. We can use it to find bounded contexts and subdomains. We can learn ubiquitous language and so on. Um, but there are actually plenty other ways of, of using domain storytelling without domain-driven design, even without building software. So people use it, for example, to identify weaknesses in business processes or to make, um, make or buy decisions when you talk about off-the-shelf systems. So um, those are all valid use cases for, um, for domain storytelling. But even then, I think, Henning, I hope you, you agree with that, we still would consider that domain-driven in a general sense as opposed to technology-driven. So I think it's um, always domain storytelling is domain-driven in, in that sense, even if you don't uh, use it for, for domain-driven design projects. Yeah, I, I agree totally. And I would say um, all these methods, they belong to um, a special mindset, which is, um, I would say, more human-centered than technology-centered. So um, building domain-driven software with DDD, using collaborative modeling like domain storytelling, um, facilitating 
BDD and all this stuff, all these things they have in common that they um, see that software is no end in itself, but that software is something that is built for a user and that the user, the, the, that's the person that we want to, uh, uh, which life we want to make better and um, how to build software. So, so it's, of course, we are all interested in technology. We are all programmers. We like um, to hack the night away, but this won't help if <laughs> we're not um, you, uh, getting the real purpose that this software um, is, is built for. Right. Now, um, so domain storytelling came from somewhere. You two have worked with it for a long time. What was, what's its origin? How did you come up with the idea? So as I said before, Henning and I met back in 2005. We were co-workers then. We still are. And our first project together was for the German federal government. And um, the project had started a couple of weeks before I joined the company. And after I joined the project, my colleagues showed me these pictures with stick figures and arrows and the labels on them and said, okay, this is the, the business process. Um, this is what we are supposed to to, uh, to do with our software. And they told me a story, a story that they had been told just a few weeks earlier by the future users of the system. So domain storytelling kind of already existed back then. It has its roots um, at the University of Hamburg. Um, that's where uh, we learned it and um, where, well, where we got introduced to its predecessor. Back then it was more of a, let's say, enterprise modeling method. So what we did uh, is we, we boiled it down, we distilled the essence out of it, uh, left some, some things um, out so it's easier to use, and we gave it a catchy name. And of course that name is, has a close resemblance to, to domain-driven design that was by intention. So we called it domain storytelling and yeah, started to, to spread the word. Yeah. What it's maybe also interesting talking about history is that this uh, predecessor of um, of domain storytelling, which used to be called Exemplarische Geschäftsprozessmodellierung, um, was invented um, in, with a background of um, another idea of developing software, which is kind of similar to DDD, um, but which was called or which is called tools and materials approach, or in German, Werkzeug und Materialansatz. And the interesting thing is, it was developed totally independent from DDD, but it has um, many similarities with, with different names. And um, one thing that we don't have in DDD, but uh, with which is also interesting in DDD, is this idea of having tools and materials to say, hey, people in the real world, they are using tools to work on materials. And that's something that helps us build software as well, that helps in, in software architecture. So we, in software architecture, we're also building tools, which are usually some part in the UI, some part in the domain already. And then we're working on materials. Those are the entities in, in DDD speak. And um, so when um, Stefan and I uh, were introduced to DDD, uh, we were happy and said, well, Finally, there are other people in the world who also <laughs> think in this kind of um, idea. And then um, uh, we were also happy when um, two things happened. One thing was that you wrote your, your IDD book, which uh, gave, uh, gave um, the DDD movement a push. And on the other hand, microservices came and they also gave DDD a push. And then um, Matthias st started to... Uh, the, the, to uh, have the conference, DDD Europe, and so on, and and then on, in very different places, um, it, it all came up. So, I'm I'm very happy, and I think you you will agree, Stefan, that uh, there's now a lively um, and, and viable DDD community, and uh, more broadly, a, a community of um, people-centric software builders um, that come from different backgrounds and that are on on, on different. Um, uh, that are that have different backgrounds and um, that we are not alone anymore having these ideas from an academic background uh, from the university that has strange uh, German and longish names. So like I like to say, um, if you're doing 
event storming in German, make sure that you use the extra wide sticky notes. <laughs> so that that's great. That uh, was that all one word? Is that like maybe close to the longest word in in German? No, no. Actually, it's two words. <laughs> ah, but, but, okay, but but, but, but but it but it is long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. So you say that uh, domain storytelling is scenario based. You've already expressed that. Can you tell us about what a scenario is? What what does that mean? And how is domain storytelling scenario based? So the idea of scenario-based modeling is um, that we want to make it simple for the domain experts. So what we say is one story, one picture. So we want to uh, draw only one scenario scenario in one story. That's why there's no condition nodes um, in the domain story. So if you want to look at different cases, you do not model that into one picture but you draw two or three or several pictures there so that um, the domain experts are not overwhelmed by all these strange things that happen there. Also, um, as we said, it's about storytelling. And when you hear a story, a story is told like this happens and that happens and that happens. And it's not like if this, then that happens or else another thing happens. That's not how storytelling is, is going on. And we want to use something that's easily understandable um, by, by people. And this is one thing um, that's a reason for having several stories, but um, that's not the only reason. So in a typical domain stories telling session, you're telling several stories. For one reason, we want to have the different scenarios there. But another thing is that we also want to look at different scopes of domain stories. So we're selling, saying there are different scope factors. One scope factor, for example, is granularity. So we want to have coarse-grained domain stories where we paint a big picture with a broad stroke. And then we go into the details and we tell several more fine-grained stories. And typically, a coarse-grained story keeps together several small domain stories. And the small domain stories, they're not telling everything. Of course, they're looking into one part. For example, um, cost grain domain stories help with finding bound and context and then it makes sense to tell detailed stories more fine-grained stories for one bounded context yeah. and as i said before one uh, we don't want to write a whole novel so we focus on the most important stories on the most important cases of a, of a business process and those are the examples that we can learn most from and all the details yes later on we we need details to develop software but uh, if you're still in this understanding phase, in this learning curve, um, those those details can be maybe too cumbersome. So we focus on just important examples, and that's the basis for for learning more later on. Yeah, and I think a really important word here is example. So a scenario is an example, and if we go to Feynman, right, he could understand a problem very quickly because he would say, you know, okay, you've told me about this or that, but give me a concrete example. And so when you actually attach someone's name, or at least a fictitious character, a persona, a name or a role or something like that, and then they do this, then it becomes a very strong example and everybody can then follow along. Whereas when you're speaking very abstractly only about the concepts without the, the real example, it's much more difficult to understand. True. Exactly. Yeah. So then um, now it, in specification by example is a fairly well known, I think, uh, technique, which is really also called um, behavior driven development. And how can you do testing? How can you test these scenarios that they actually work um, the way that they've been drawn? Is there some kind of connection to that? I think there's a connection. Again, it depends a little bit on the on the scope, as Henning uh, explained. So, if you want to use a domain story as an, let's say as an acceptance test, then it should be on a rather fine grained level, um, so so that it uh, so that it works. So you need that level of the right level of detail to make it into a kind of acceptance test. 
Um, what we do is, for example, uh, we use um, BDD style uh, scenarios, something like, like Gherkin, for example, or maybe um, example mapping as another collaborative modeling technique to come up with um, test cases or acceptance tests based on a domain story. So it's not always that, you know, the story uh, serves every purpose. It's more like, okay, it's a, maybe it's an intermediate result. And then you look at the story and say, okay, from this story, um, maybe I can derive, a, let's say, a Gherkin scenario and then continue with that. So that's also possible. So that, that kind of leads us into the idea of scope. You, you just mentioned the scope of the story. Can you elaborate on that a bit? What is the scope of the yeah. story? So uh, again, maybe I should start with an example. So I think fine-grained, coarse-grained, that's, that's rather easy to understand, but there are other scopes as well. Um, for example, we talk about the purity of a domain story, which may sound a bit, bit odd at first. So a couple of years ago, I was brought in um, to to do a workshop um, at a company that was in the car manufacturing domain, and they um, one of their of of the subdomains was um, testing new equipment. So they had to put new parts into cars and then do certain tests and so on. And there was a whole logistical process um, that made that possible. Basically, they had to build prototypes and, and stuff like that. And they had a piece of software that supported that process of, you know, um, building this, this prototype car. And they had outsourced the maintenance and further development of that software. So soon after that, they, they said, OK, um, the, the, new, the company that took care of the, of the software said, we don't understand the purpose of the software, what it is supposed to do. So we had this workshop, we brought in the, the domain experts, the users of the software, the new development team. And I tried domain storytelling in a way that is with software systems. So how do you use the software? And they said, well, first we fill out a screen A7 and then we fill out screen B12 and so on and so on and so on. So the software that they used, it was so bad. It had so little of the, of the domain concepts in it. Um, it actually led to the domain expert losing their own language and adopting the technical jargon of the, of the software. So what we did is we tried this pure domain stories where I said, okay, forget about the software. I'm not modeling any software systems here. Tell me the intent. What, what is your intent when you do something? Well, and then the test manager said, um, well, uh, first I want to specify my test configuration. So I drew a stick figure, that's the test manager, and I drew a little uh, document icon with a test specification, and I drew an arrow, so he specifies the test specification, and so on. And that this is a kind of pure story, so it's the intention, the pure intention, without any, um, without any software systems. And we try to gave the domain experts their language back. So this was one kind of software. So it, it was still a kind of as-is process, how, it, uh, how people do the, the work today. But it was um, pure in, in style. And it was rather fine-grained already because there, there are many steps involved. We did another domain story after that. And um, again, the scope, the level of detail was, was uh, rather similar. But this time it was with IT systems. So it was a digitalized uh, story, as we call them. Um, and then we could contrast them. So we could, um, we could put them side by side. This is the intent. And this is all the complexity added by the software system. And that finally helped to, to understand um, how to, to uh, maintain the software. So those are just two examples of, of different styles of, of domain stories or different scopes. Yeah. Another scope factor is the point in time. Um, so that means it can be interesting to look at a process in different points of, in time. So we usually start with an as-is process. How is the story today? And then we move on to a to-be process. How will this process be when the new software system is there or when a new um, law is in place and uh, the process has to change? 
So it's interesting also to look over the time, not only how is it now, but also how will it be in, in, in the future. So there's these different factors that we call the scope altogether. That's granularity, point in time, and as Stefan said, domain purity. So all of this really is pointing to human collaboration, conversations with dif different kinds of business people and developers at, you know, at different examples or scenarios. So the pandemic has now changed everything. We're not together or maybe just now starting to, to find some ways to collaborate with humans at even a distance and uh, talking with masks for very long is just no fun. So what do we do now with this situation that we're in? Yeah, so um, I totally agree that it was um, not good for human collaboration and especially not in um, modeling software, understanding what people are doing, uh, that we have to move in the home office um, altogether. Um, nonetheless, I think that um, the tooling that we have today can um, help us a lot, even in a remote or in a distributed situation. So if you have the right tooling, for example, we use um, a tool that's called egan.io. Um, that's, that's obviously also the URL of the tool. Uh, it's open source, so um, listeners to this might check that out. Um, that's, that's a browser-based tool, um, which uh, can be shared over a screen in Teams or Zoom or whatever. And then um, people um, can do pretty nice um, domain storytelling sessions also in a remote manner. Of course, what you cannot see as easily as when you are in the same room is when the people roll their eyes, uh, when the two people turn away. But still, you can see things like um, people turn off their video or don't turn their video on and all this stuff. So that also tells you these kinds of problems. And if you have a willing group um, of people who um, want to contribute, then domain storytelling can be easily done over a remote session. And there can be, um, th th there are good, even great results coming out of that. One thing, of course, that's always important, and especially when you're in the remote situation, is that you do enough breaks. <laughs> so Stefan and I have a rule um, that at least every hour, there should be a short break of five or 10 minutes. Um, because otherwise the people, they get lost and are anywhere, but not in your modeling session, of course. We're, we're just going to include your daughter as a domain expert here. So no worries. We're, we know um, we're all at home. And so, hey, we're relaxed. We love doing this and we hope everybody understands. But I don't know. She inspires me, just what she has to say. <laughs> So um, actually, Stefan, didn't you implement this tool? I've, I've more of a, let's say, product owner role these days. So um, so it was actually, was it originally a desktop or it was always a browser tool? Uh, it was always a browser tool, but we didn't build it from scratch. It's based on a piece of BPNN software by Camunda. So it's, uh, ah, okay. it's a tried and proven um, core and we we taught Camundo's BPNN modeler how to speak domain storytelling. Nice uh, use of open source. Yes, definitely. Open so source. when you, um, I know both of you do training with domain storytelling. Uh, maybe I, I didn't ask you before, Henning, but maybe you were doing some training like that today. And uh, can you just tell us how that works when, when you're training people? How does, how does that happen for them? What kinds of tips can you give us for using this on a team. Yeah, actually today I um, did a domain storytelling consulting job, but tomorrow my next um, domain storytelling workshop uh, and training is starting. And that will be two half days tomorrow and uh, the day after that. Um, so eight hours in total, that's, I would say, um, the, the short um, variant of, of domain storytelling uh, trainings. and. When we give these trainings, then um, we show people different things. So we usually start with showing the method, and that's easily done. 
you know, that's a, a basic pictographic language that's easy to learn. And then we show it's a workshop format and you have to bring together the right people. And then, of course, we tell them about the scenario-based stuff and the scope and how this works in their practice. And then we go into the purposes. So we show people how to use that tool for their problems. For example, for finding boundaries and bounded context, if that is your what you're interested in. Or uh, we, and then we usually move on from when you have found the bounded context, how do we build a domain model? How do we implement a domain model? How do we derive that from the domain knowledge? So we move on from coarse grain domain stories to more fine grained domain stories and see um, what's happening there. And we usually um, bring an, uh, an example domain that we know all this stuff is working. <laughs> and then um, if we have the time, we then move on um, and take an example by one or several of our participants to see, hey, in your domain, what do all these strange words, domain storytelling, DDD, bounded context, microservices, what, what does that mean in your context, in, in, in your domain? So that's typically the highlight. Stefan, I think also for you and me, because the other stuff we already know what we're yeah. going to talk about, but going into a new domain, that's of course always fun. And that's, 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 right. you that's always know what we to learn something. Yeah, it's always new domains, so that's that's exciting for us too. Yeah. But I think that the takeaway is, uh, at least what, what I do when I prepare for a new uh, workshop um, as a moderator or facilitator, I always have this little checklist, like do I know what purpose uh, or what, what is the goal of the workshop? What should the outcome be? So that's the first thing. And that determines the scope. So are we looking at as is, or are we looking at uh, designing a, a new process? And that also determines the people that uh, one needs to invite. For example, uh, you want real domain experts, not proxies, not proxy experts. And if it's about software development, you should invite people from the team, from the development team. You don't want this to become uh, or turn into a, a telephone game where, you know, the business analyst does all the workshops and then later goes to the to development team and says, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. No, no, it doesn't work like that, at least not the way that uh, I do it. Yeah. That That is the proxy right there. That's yeah. when things get broken. Uh, well completely misunderstood because yeah you we've all played the telephone game i i use that analogy in our current book uh strategic monuments and microservices by the time even two or three people away it's the story has changed 10 people forget about it you know it's it's gone so very good very good um ideas and uh henning you have yeah. some more yeah, one more thing that um, I would like to add to this question, how, how um, our trainings and how are our sessions um, going on? I think what's also important is um, to combine that with a topic that we had earlier. Um, how is it going on in the time of the pandemic and probably also after that? Um, so we actually have kind of two trainings. We have the variant that is for on-premise, um, being directly with people, and a variant doing it remote. And I would say there are um, what I couldn't believe before the pandemic started. I would say today they are equally good. Um, they have, of course, a different focus and they use different tooling. But it's also nice to learn that tooling and to see how you can collaborate um, when you are in the same room or um, when you're not in the same room. And um, there are even things that are better in the remote situation than in a not a remote situation. One thing is, for example, that you have really an unlimited modeling space. So um, everybody has the same access. And um, for shy people, it's sometimes better to sit on a computer and to, co uh, to contribute to things um, where you don't have to uh, put yourself into the front of people um, when you say, well, I I'm doing something on the whiteboard or on the wall. So for me today, it's a really um, both things is are, are are working good and both things are interesting um, depending on um, what the surroundings are. And I think one of the biggest tips you could probably give is people should read your book. I think, right? I mean, uh, I think your book is probably the the least pages in the series so far. Did you end up with about 
225 chapter pages, something like that. Yeah. And uh, there, there's always, they always say more pages because of front matter, back matter and all that stuff. But the real, you know, thrust of the book is about that long. I know that people can read uh, Domain Driven Design Distilled, which is about, I think, 160 chapter pages. They can read it in a day or, you know, over a weekend for certain. So probably someone could read your book in about the same length of time, maybe slightly longer. But, you know, it, it may actually be easier to understand domain storytelling than the actual concepts of DDD, I would think. Yeah. I, I would agree. Um, that's probably easier. And um, that's also what we tried. We tried to write a concise book and um, we started with, oh, there are so many interesting topics that we want to talk about, that we want to write about. But um, that was good that we were two authors. So we were able to say to each other, no, stop. <laughs> this topic is not going to make it into the book. <laughs> it should be readable and it should be understandable for technical people, but our intent is also to at least the start of the book uh, be understandable for domain people, for users, for people that have no programming background. And um, later in the second part of the book, well, there are of course things when we talk about how to find boundaries for bounded context, then it's then you have to know what a bounded context is. And when we see how you can implement an aggregate, then it makes, of course, sense to know what an, an, an entity and an aggregate are. Um, but um, I think uh, the first part of the book, um, that's something that you can easily um, read in a day or over a weekend. And um, it's also that um, even if it's 250 pages or what in a chapter, that's not 250 pages text that you have to read, but there's many, many different drawings, of course, and other pictures to support um, the, the learning of that. And um, having said that, I think um, even if you're not um, willing to use the method domain storytelling, um, but you are interested in all this um, DDD stuff, collaborative modeling stuff, um, even then, I think you should give it a try because we are writing um, on... Yes, we're writing on domain storytelling, but many of the things that uh, we described there are more basic for the whole collaborative modeling thing and can easily be applied with user story mapping, event storming, example mapping, and stuff like that. So things that we were talking about earlier, like the scenario-based versus um, showing the whole picture, that's that's interesting um, only if you're interested in, or that, that's, that's interested in, um, even if you're not interested in domain storytelling itself, but in modeling in a, in a more general sense. So to kind of um, summarize or put a nice finish on our conversation, which has been quite informative, what is your favorite memory of domain storytelling? And, and just before you tell your favorite memory, my favorite memory right now is that you changed the name from those two German words to domain storytelling. Thank you. That is a very good memory. <laughs> but uh, go ahead, whichever one of you would like to I, share yours. I still have a picture of the whiteboard with all the possible names that we came up with and domain storytelling was the winner. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start first. Um, my favorite memory, well, as I said before, I'm Austrian. We are a mountain people. So whenever I have the chance to to model something um, in in the harbor uh, of Hamburg. It's very exotic for me and, and very interesting. Uh, it's all new to me. So a couple of years ago, I did uh, something for a disaster response team uh, in the harbor. And back then, I guess I was more naive. So I said, well, you know, it's all very complicated. And um, um, my job there was to uh, find out about um, who informs whom and and how to improve that and possibly how to improve that with software. So um, how are all these these informations going from one person to the next in case of a disaster? And so I guess I was a bit more naive then. I said, well, can you start with a happy path? Because I was looking for a simple case first. And they looked at me with a funny expression on the face and said, well, there are no happy paths. We are the disaster response team. Don't you understand that? 
So, okay, uh, made a great first impression with them. Um, but then um, we settled on, okay, let, give me three examples. Um, one that is, let's say, not a complete disaster, like a small, uh, maybe just locally something, then uh, medium-sized and one where, you know, you, you call, for example, the mayor in the middle of the night, something like that. So they gave me three incredible rich examples of things that actually happened or almost happened in the in the last couple of years. So those were really uh, good domain stories that we learned a lot from. That's that's my favorite. Um, yeah, I, I really had to think about that. Um, one of my favorite situations um, was when I was working with a company um, that built an accounting software. Um, which sounded pretty boring for me because before I, I got to the job, so um, I didn't think that would that would, this would be a, a great thing there. Um, and accounting software, very old software. They had built the software for forty years or so, and it started out, I think, in COBOL, and then it was um, migrated to C plus plus, and we still had a very old code base in C plus plus, and. On the other hand, they had managed to keep the software all this time alive. So apparently it did its domain job very good. So they had a good understanding of their domain. And nonetheless, what was lacking in the software was a good or great domain model. And they wanted to um, achieve that again. And so um, they invited me to model their domain with them. And we started on a cost band level. We derived bounded context. That was all fine. but but what really was nice was when we got into the details and um, I found out this this process wasn't boring at all. <laughs> it was um, very interested, interesting with all um, the details that we had there. And then uh, we draw um, several domain stories on the whiteboards and the wall. And then we switched and said, OK, now let's put this into code. And um, we switched to a mob programming session and then I kind of dictated to one of the programmers of the team, okay, now um, we start with writing um, a unit test, or technically it's a unit test, but probably it's more of an acceptance test. And we see this is happening and we see this work object on the wall and that will become an entity in our domain. And that work object here will become a, a value object here. And we're doing this before that. So this will be our test case. and. Um, we started to write the test case, which kind of cut our domain model out of it. So one of the nice things of, of, of TDD there. And um, in a session of, I think, two days, if I remember that, um, we ended up with um, a, a very good first version of a, a domain model prototype, um, which then... Um, yeah, which looked really beautiful, and um, not even not only me, all the other participants as well um, were um, were very happy with, the, with what came out. And um, a couple of months later, they um, had built um, their system from this old C plus plus system into um, a shiny new version of itself, um, still having um, many of the old domain knowledge in our um, much more beautiful and more modern forms. And when that happens, um, that's the most fun for me when we start with all these arrows and boxes, but we end up with real code that's running <laughs> um, ideally in production in the end. Thank you very much for those uh, nice examples and this nice conversation. So if folks want to get in touch with you, your company in English, is uh, wps.de and actually it's an abbreviation for for uh, in, in English words it's called WPS is for workplace solutions we even use that in German so but but we say WPS very good your, your German is very nice <laughs> okay guys um, thanks very much and hope to talk to you again soon it was our pleasure thanks for having us.